Thank you to The Motley Fool for sponsoring a portion of this video. California recently announced they won't allow cars with modified ECUs on their roads. Modifications which affect emissions are already illegal, but now even ECU mods that don't affect emissions are. Now, I have a scientific mindset, so I wanna see the evidence that modified ECUs are actually bad for emissions. So I did my own research, and no, that doesn't mean I Googled it. I spent thousands of hours, decades, experimenting in the lab, asking the tough questions that no one wanted to ask, studying ECUs and their effects. Okay, actually, I asked a bunch of experts to explain it to me. I don't know everything, guys. I'm the smartest guy in Florida, but that doesn't really mean a lot. <laughs> so drawing on their decades of experience, we're gonna take a closer look at ECU modifications, figure out the benefits and the risk of modifying them, and see how ECU tuning is actually done. Callie, I love you, but you might be on the wrong side of science with this one. Let's figure it out. Thank you to The Motley Fool for sponsoring a portion of this video. Are you investing in stocks for the first time or maybe just looking for a new tool to help grow your portfolio? Then say hello to The Motley Fool, a subscription stock picking service where members gain access to their library of expert stock recommendations, which are carefully aimed at multiplying members' returns. With so many cryptos and mean stocks making it hard to know where to invest, it's never been more important to have an expert team of analysts on your side to help. But Jerry, can't we just use Reddit? Are you sure you wanna do that? That got me in a lot of trouble this past year. Because The Motley Fool's average stock pick has returned over 500% as of August, 2021. That's beating the market by almost five times. Every single month, members receive two new stock picks from The Motley Fool's legendary investors sent directly to their inbox. So visit fool.com slash donut media to access a special $99 new member offer. That's an entire year's worth of stock picks for just $99. $99. Let's go back to the show. Thanks to Motley Fool for sponsoring that portion of this video. In a modern car with loads of electronics, the ECU is the central computer that controls nearly everything. But when they were first introduced in the 70s and 80s, ECUs only cared about three things air, fuel, and spark. But car enthusiasts care a lot about air, fuel, and spark, so it wasn't long before they were tuning ECUs. And tuning is just modifying engine systems that control the amount of air and fuel and timing of that spark. In the old days, that meant physically changing things like replacing fuel jets in a carburetor or fiddling with a distributor. Mechanical controls only have so much adjustability though, so tuners and even manufacturers often had to sacrifice easy drivability or emissions for power. Automotive engineers figured out that you could reduce those trade-offs and get more precise control over air and fuel and spark by using electronic control. So the carburetor was replaced by fuel injection and the distributor with ignition coils. Then they added a computer because that could be programmed to alter air fuel ratios and spark timing on the fly and thus the ECU was born. And with it, so was ECU tuning. A lot of enthusiasts want maximum power, but ECUs from the factory aren't tuned for that. So to get more power, tuners did what they've always done. They modified the system controlling air, fuel, and spark. But instead of turning screws or swapping parts, tuners were now writing code. Code. Tuners were now writing code. Like every computer, an ECU receives input and generates output based on its program. The earliest ECUs had their programs stored on chips that were soldered onto their circuit boards. Modifying an ECU required physically replacing a chip with one containing a different program. That's where the term chipping or chip tuning comes from, and those early programs, they weren't all that sophisticated. A lot of modern tuning is still based around some ideas from the early days, like maps. Those are tables where the X and Y values correspond to inputs from vehicle sensors. In modern ECUs, inputs can come from a hundred or more sensors. But in the early days, inputs were often limited to airflow, throttle position, engine RPM, and exhaust gases. The individual cells of maps contain output values and early ECU programs were often based around a fuel map. That's, well, let's hear it from an expert himself. So what exactly, in layman's terms, is a fuel map and how do you use a fuel map 
when you tune. Okay, so if we were talking, say, like a standalone ECU or a, a more do-it-yourself uh, control unit to control the, the particular engine, the most basic map would be injector pulse width uh, versus load, which in most cases just boost versus RPM. And at that particular load point, uh, you tell the, the ECU to command X amount of injector pulse width and it equals an AFR that, that, that you want. The point of a custom fuel map isn't to dump as much fuel as possible into the engine. Oh no. How much fuel your engine can burn is limited by how much air it's getting. And that's why engine load is derived from sensors that detect airflow or throttle position. The ECU controls the injector pulse to fine tune that air fuel ratio. The stoichiometric air fuel ratio for pump gas is around 14.7. One. That's 14.7 parts air for every one part fuel. That's theoretically the perfect ratio where all of the oxygen and gasoline combust, releasing all of the fuel stored energy. But that ratio assumes the air and fuel are perfectly mixed. And in the real world, that doesn't happen. If you feed an engine with that perfect ratio, the actual distribution of fuel molecules will vary inside the cylinder. Some areas are gonna have more, leaving some fuel unburnt after combustions. Others, they're gonna have less, leaving some oxygen after combustion. To compensate for that imperfect mixing, a tuner can reprogram the ECU to inject extra fuel, targeting a ratio around 13 to 1. A slightly rich ratio, meaning there's more fuel, ensures that there's enough fuel for all of the oxygen to get used up. That creates the largest possible combustion reaction and produces the most power. But some of that extra gas doesn't get burned. Manufacturers, they don't tune cars this way. They compensate for imperfect mixing in the other direction using a slightly lean ratio of 15 or 16 to one. That's because unburnt gas is bad for fuel economy and a slightly lean mixture ensures that no gas goes unburned, even if that means less power. So. The ECU controls the amount of fuel getting to the engine, and that can be tuned based on the amount of air to maximize power or fuel efficiency. But most ECUs have control over the spark or ignition timing too, and that plays an important role in power as well. The spark that sets off combustion needs to happen near the end of the compression stroke, a little bit before the piston reaches top dead center. That's because combustion takes time to travel from the ignition point at the spark plug to the crown of the piston. To make the best use of the combustion's energy, you need the flame front to reach the piston just as it's changing direction for the power stroke. If you want to learn more about the four cycles of an engine, click here and watch this sweet music video about suck, squeeze, bang, blow. But ignition timing isn't controlled by a clock. When the spark plug fires is based on the position of the engine's rotation. For example, around 10 degrees before top dead center, the distance and speed the flame front travels is always the same but the speed at which the piston is moving changes based on engine speed. That means as revs increase, so does the number of degrees before top dead center the spark need to happen to achieve maximum power. ECU tuners, they will sometimes advance the ignition by several degrees to ensure they're getting everything out of each combustion, especially at high revs. Now the risk to advancing timing too much is detonation. That's when fuel ahead of the flame front ignites prematurely due to rising heat and pressure inside the cylinder. Detonation create shock waves that can damage the engine. You can actually hear this happening and that's why detonation is sometimes called knocking. So to avoid this, manufacturers tune ECUs with conservative ignition timing, sacrificing some power. So ECU tuning can increase power by altering spark with ignition timing and by adding more fuel with longer ejector pulses. All that's left to figure out is how the ECU can add more air. And for a lot of engines, it can't. You'll sometimes hear people describe engine as air pumps, and the more air an engine can pump, the more power it'll make. Remember, we got that sweet equation, more air plus more fuel equals more power. And airflow in older cars was often limited by their intake or exhaust, which were restricted for noise or emissions reasons. But those systems have drastically improved, and in modern cars, the amount of air the engine can pump in really is limited by two other factors. There's the engine's displacement, which an ECU obviously can't do anything about, and there's the density of air coming into the engine, which an ECU also can't do anything about, unless that engine has a turbo. We talked to a lot of different tuners to make this episode, and the one feature they all agreed was nearly essential for ECU tuning to make big power, forced induction. <laughs> That's because a turbo's only job is to increase the density of air being fed to the motor. Denser air means more oxygen in the same amount of space. You add in more fuel to that, which we know the ECU can do, and you can produce 
more power. But with an increase in density comes an increase in pressure and temperature. And if either of those get too high, that can damage your engine. So a factory tuned ECU, it limits a turbo's boost pressure to a safe PSI value. Now what you've seen so far is really just the basics. And 20 or 30 years ago, that might have been all you needed to know to start tuning yourself. Modern tuning is a whole new world with more variables, more precision, and more expertise needed to do it right. What are the major things you can change with an ECU tune? Uh, wow, so uh, not only just torque and, and horsepower uh, at peak values, but the, all the drivability, you can do uh, quite a bit of sound tuning, fuel economy. The torque model, as I'm, I'm bridging this, correlates to, mm -hmm. to this particular map. They have to get funneled through, through what's called relative filling or commanded relative filling, commanded to, torque out uh, knock intervention, hexadecimal fuel mass, and A2L file, basically which will less relative filling intervention. ECU tuning, is super complicated. Modern cars can have hundreds of sensors delivering inputs to the ECU. Things like wheel speed, steering force, even whether the car is on level ground or not, all become input for a modern ECU. Not only that, ECUs are part of an entire network inside your car, including dedicated computers that control the transmission, separate ones for safety features like stability control, and others for comfort features like power windows. These all have to communicate with each other, and part of ECU tuning is knowing how all those systems play together. We also learned that there are lots of reasons why cars are detuned from the factory. Cars are sold in many parts of the world in different parts of the country. That means a car has to perform at sea level, in 12,000 feet of elevation, and everything in between. It also has to perform in the heat of Death Valley or the cold of Alaska, and it needs to keep working if the owner uses crappy fuel or floors it at every stoplight when they take off. Nolan Sykes. Cars are expected to live hard lives, so they come with ECU tunes that play it safe, but that also makes them tunable. The people we talked to said that they looked at two things in an engine. First is the ability to flow lots of air, being a good air pump, and that means having an unrestrictive intake, head and exhaust, and most importantly, a turbo. The second thing is being built for durability. We did a whole B2B on engines that are overbuilt, and the people we talked to for this episode said they look for pretty much everything we talked about in that episode. They also repeatedly talked about the big old, what's the thing in the room? Elephant? Yeah, thank you. They also repeatedly talked about the big old elephant in the room, emissions equipment. Several mentioned that some of their ECU tunes have performed better in emissions testing than a factory tune. Disabling emissions equipment is actually detrimental to tuning. The systems of sensors of modern cars are so highly integrated that the same ones keeping track of emissions are essential for optimizing performance. What matters most for emissions is that the exhaust comes out clean, and that happens because of good catalytic converters and optimized combustion, something tunes are very good at. So there's your crash course in ECU tuning. A long time ago, enthusiasts were trying to use ECU tuning to get around restrictive emissions equipment, but times change, and now that same equipment is essential for tuning itself. So is a ban on ECU tuning supported by the best available evidence? I don't know that it is. The worst consequences may not even be for us enthusiasts, because banning ECU tuning affects an entire industry with many small businesses and smart innovators, the same people who helped us make this episode. If an ECU tuner wants to make their modification legal for use on California roads, they have to spend thousands of dollars for certification, and many small tuners simply can't afford that. Thank you guys so much for watching this episode of B2B. Do you live in California? Are you mad that they're banning your modified ECU? Do you not live in California and don't care? <laughs> Let me know down in the comments below. Uh, thank you so much for watching B2B. We love you guys. Uh, follow us here at Donut on Instagram at Donut Media. Follow me at Jeremiah Burton. And until next week.